want to welcome all of you today to the second in a, a series uh, that we are hosting on racism and politics. Today's event is Behind Closed Doors, White Supremacy and the Roots of Anti-Blackness in Latino and Asian American and Pacific Islander Communities. The series itself titled Behind Closed Doors is a four-part webinar series that explores the entrenchment of racism in US politics and its impact on political power and representation in communities. The series is hosted by uh, us, uh, the Center for Inclusive Democracy, along with very much our partners, the California Black Freedom Fund, the Latino Community Foundation, and the AAPI Civic Engagement Fund. And of course, our home partner here, the USC Price School of Public Policy, whose communications team has uh, made all of this possible uh, in terms of the technical side and helping to arrange the webinar. So we thank them very much. I also like to, would like to individually uh, acknowledge uh, my, the, the folks that I worked with at each of our partnering organizations, uh, Mark Philpart, Christian Arana, and Unsuk Lee, uh, who were true partners in designing this webinar series, being very thoughtful about our goals and the conversations that we wanted to create um, and in all elements of the thinking and planning. So thank them very much. Um, some of you may have seen the first webinar uh, in this series uh, back on December 14th. We're gonna put links to that webinar in just a moment in our, in our chat if you haven't seen it. We give more background on the series itself. Uh, I won't go over that again today, but just to say that we hope that today's conversation like, like the one on December 14th is a, a, an open, challenging conversation. We hope this is one that lives on beyond today, uh, not just in the recording, but hopefully stirring and um, encouraging more uh, thought and more engagement on this topic. And um, I wanna recognize that we just have an hour. And of course, all of our uh, panelists, our steam panel could speak much longer and I'm sure would want to speak much longer on this topic and are unfortunately constrained by time. So we'll, we'll just be kind of uh, starting, breaking breaking the topic, but clearly not having a complete conversation as we would like to have if we had more time. Um, I'm gonna jump in to introduce our panel. So uh, first, Dr. Uh, Claire Jean Kim. Uh, Dr. Kim is a professor of political science and Asian American studies. Her first book, Bitter Fruit, The Politics of Black Korean Conflict in New York City is a recipient of the American Political Science Ah, just looking at, there's a reminder in the chat um, on questions today. Uh, is a recipient of the American Political Science Association's Ralph Bunch Award for Best Book on Ethnic and Cultural Pluralism and a Best Book Award for the American Political Science Association Organized Section on Race, Ethnicity, Politics. Dr. Kim has written numerous journal articles, book chapters, and essays, and she is co-editor of a special issue on American Quarterly entitled Species, Race, Sex. She's a recipient of a grant from the University of California Center for New Racial Studies, and she has been a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, and the University of California, oops, if I can find my notes, and the University of California Humanities Research Institute. She has been a guest uh, commentator on numerous uh, media platforms, podcasts, print, uh, TV, and she's currently writing a book on Asian Americans, Affirmative Action, and Contemporary Racial Politics. Dr. Kim, thank you very much for joining us today. And by the way, full bios, links to full bios will be included in the chat in just a little bit. Uh, next, Gloria Medina. So for the past 30 years, SCOPE, that's Strategic Concepts in Organizing and uh, Policy Education, has been recognized as a key social justice organization based in South Los Angeles. SCOPE has played a critical role in developing cutting edge strategies to ensure that black and brown working class families have equitable, equitable participation in the democratic process. For the last 15 years, Gloria has been a South Los Angeles leader committed to building power, community power through organizing leadership development, alliance building and policy advocacy. Gloria's leadership has been instrumental in developing strategies for long-term systemic change to address economic inequalities and climate impacts in frontline communities. Over the last two years, Gloria has served as SCOPE's executive director, leading the organization's commitment to racial justice in pursuit of a healthier and prosperous Los Angeles, South Los Angeles. And last but not least, Tracy Stafford. And Gloria, thank you very much for joining us today, I should say. Um, so moving on to Tracy. 
Tracy Stafford is the founder and CEO of Stafford Consulting Group, a California-based consulting firm specializing in organizational culture and system change with an emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, Tracy's background includes over 25 years in executive leadership, advocacy, organizational culture change, project development, DEI, behavioral, leverage facilitation, negotiation, and mediation services delivered nationwide. Politically, Tracy has been a social justice advocate for decades and was recently appointed to the position of vice chair, Northern Region of the California Democratic Party Black Caucus. She has also served as the president of the Women Democrats of Sacramento County, Assembly District 9 Delegate, and E-Board Representative, Sacramento Area NAACP Political Director, Sacramento County Elections Advisory Board Member, and is the first African-American woman to chair the Democratic Party of Sacramento County. Tracy, welcome. All right, so jumping in, just to set the stage a, a little bit here, um, so the U.S., I, I think we all know now, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, the U.S. as a nation was built on the systemic uh, exclusion and suppression of communities of color, right? All of this wrapped up and justified by the ideology of white supremacy. As an ideology, it imposes, it does what ideologies do. It imposes and maintains cultural, social, political, historical, and or institutional domination by white people and non-white supporters. So, Claire. Um, please talk to us today about what anti-Blackness is and why it is seen within Latino and Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. So I've spent about the last seven years finishing a book called Asian Americans in anti which is due out next spring. And so I'm going to be drawing upon that research. Um, in that research, I look at um, the work of a lot of cutting edge research in um, black studies that is going on right now in academy. Some of it drawing upon the work of philosopher Frantz Fanon and his discussions of what he called necrophobia. Um, black studies scholars today are talking about anti-blackness based on Fanon's concept. And there are a lot of people in the audience who probably don't know what that anti-blackness means. So I'm glad to have the chance to speak to that. Um, it refers to a phobic avoidance or hatred Blackness and the idea of foundational anti blackness or structural anti blackness conveys that blackness or this phobic avoidance or hatred of blackness sits at the very center of our society. It's what it's sort of the principle around which our social order is organized. Um, so we can think from slavery to Jim Crow to mass incarceration and police murder today and segregation, we can see that principle at work. So it's more specific than the idea of racism, right, in the sense that it's naming the specific hatred or avoidance of blackness as sort of a core organizing principle of American society. And of course, it arose in tandem with racial slavery uh, around the world and in the United States and served to just a rationalist institution. Um, Okay, what about white supremacy? So what is the relationship between anti-blackness and white supremacy? Um, they're not synonymous. And in my book, I really draw upon the work of philosopher Lewis Gordon, who says the U.S. racial order is defined by two principles, be white, but above all. So he talks about principles of white supremacy, be white, and anti-blackness, above all, don't be black. And so the way that I like to think about it is anti-blackness and white supremacy are two related but distinct forces that work together to shape the U.S. racial order. And let me give you a metaphor to help think about what these things do. Blackness pushes Black people down and lifts up everyone who is not Black. White supremacy lifts up people who are considered white and pushes down everyone who is considered not white. Okay, so you can see, looking at those two forces, what happens with Black people pushed down by both, what happens to white people lifted up by both, but what happens to the other not white groups? Here's where it starts to get interesting. For Asian Americans and Latinx folks, they are both pushed down by white supremacy and simultaneously lifted up by anti-blackness. So what this means is because we have a society that is structured, the first principle of which is anti-blackness, that Asian Americans, for example, are advantaged structurally compared with black people, even though at the same time they are disadvantaged compared with white people. And that, you know, is part of what creates this complexity and um, right, the vexed sort of complexity of, of how these other groups are situated. 
Alicia Garza, who's one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter, in her essay, her story of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, talks about the fact that Latinx and Asian American folks benefit from anti-Black racism. And this is part of what I'm talking about when I say that other not white groups are structurally positioned to have certain kinds of immunities, certain kinds of advantages um, that are denied to black people. And as a result, they negotiate their way around blackness and whiteness, trying to get closer to whiteness and on the whole, trying to distance from blackness, which I think is very crucial to what is going on here with the scandal that brought us all here today to talk about the um, LA City Council scandal. I think that's really the crux of what's going on. So I just would say in closing that if we just talk about white supremacy, again, this idea of all not white groups being pushed down and whiteness being elevated, then we miss more than half of the picture. And that more than half the picture is anti-blackness, the avoidance or hatred of blackness that arose in the period of racial slavery and has stayed with us to this day, shaping our culture and our society um, very profoundly, even though we deny it as a culture. Thank you very much. Uh, so I want to just, before we move on to the next question, I want to check in with Gloria and Tracy, to see if there is anything additionally that you'd like to add uh, to Dr. Kim's um, answer to, to her overview on the question. Thank you so much for that, that clarity and that di distinguishing uh, both. I think it's important to understand the dynamics of what is going on. Um, I, I would just like to add that, you know, there, there has been a commitment um, of folks who have dedicated their lives to doing black, brown solidarity um, and, um, and liberation work. Um, and and the, I want to uplift this because I think what was just shared is really important in understanding that these efforts that we have been um, involved in and the work that we have been doing, particularly in South LA, um, have been to unite those forces and to have these deep conversations, both with Black uh, and Brown, Latino, uh, and Africa, African American communities, um, so that we can understand issues that unite us and that oppress both uh, um, communities. But I think it's really important to be able to understand the specific uh, particular issues that um, impact uh, one another, the, the communities. Uh, I, I would also just, you know, to elevate as my experience as a Latina, as the daughter of immigrants, as a leader in South LA, as someone who's been doing black, brown organizing, um, you know, how I have experienced the reality and the ugliness of anti-blackness and how prevalent this sentiment is among Latino communities. Um, I would say that maybe some of my counterparts um, don't like to acknowledge it because it's, it's, an, it's ugly. Um, it's an ugly truth, but the reality is that we need to start by acknowledging uh, this long history of anti-blackness in our in our community. I would add that having conversations with folks on the ground, something that is very um, is very apparent is that um, that that our folks that have immigrated, Latinos, brown Latinos who have immigrated into this country. Um, bring these sentiments with them from their um, country of origin. And not to excuse and not saying that this doesn't exist in the U.S. Uh, obviously, we know that's not the truth. But immigrant communities are also grappling with this long history of anti-Blackness, not only here um, as they're sharing space, for example, in communities like South L.A. with Black neighbors, but this is something that has a long history and that they bring also into their immigrant experience um, into, into the United States. Um, the last thing I just want to say is that also we need to make sure that we elevate this issue of anti-Blackness and that we frame it beyond Black versus Latino. Um, and the reason why I say this is because Latino, the term Latino is very complex, right? Um, we generally think of Latinos as brown people from specific countries that speak a specific language with a specific uh, culture. But Latino is more complex than that. It's not just the mestizaje the, the mestizaje of European and ind indigenous race, but um, it's also black um, and white um, and all of the brown colors in between. And so uh, for Latinos, a lot of times success or the way that we have defined success is how adjacent or how close we are, our lives are to whiteness. Um, being in white neighborhoods, um, having white education, achieving the white American dream. 
And so given our diversity um, of, of Latinos, um, who, you know, some Latinos who could pass into whiteness, um, it is important that uh, we elevate this and we have this hard conversation of how we view uh, particular folks in our Latino community. Thank you very much, Gloria. Tracy, is there anything else that you'd like to add? Uh, sure. Um, that was all very well said and, and so true. Um, and it's it's interesting because, of course, we all know this to be uh, true and, and, you know, factual, but it's important to remember, I believe, the, the social sustainability sort of aspect in this. When we talk about sustainability, we generally focus on environmental, but it's also economic and it is social. And although environmental, the environmental uh, leg is wagging the, the dog basically as the tip, it really should be the social driving everything else. So when we talk about uh, the systemic um, uh, racism and, and basically the anti-Blackness that this country was built upon, um, it, it's important to uh, remember that, you know, Black people are not a monolith, right, which is what we what was mentioned about the, the Latinx community, that we have folks that are um, immigrants from other countries who don't have a history of having been enslaved, and the African-American experience is very different from that. So you'll hear folks talk about, um, you know, Eidos, um, the, the American descendants of the enslaved, from the food that we eat to the dysfunction in our families to having being stripped of all culture. Our culture was created of slavery, and that is an impact. So even within the um, Black community, um, there is anti-Blackness there uh, that is also based on the lowest common denominator or the lowest in the caste system within the anti-Black or the Black community, which would be the descendants of the American enslaved. So this is so complex and it's a, a social issue that um, is supported by the infrastructure that we have built in this country. So as we are learning, and that's what I keep, there's so much learning and training and we've got to talk about it. But the reality is that uh, there are physiological and neurological reasons that even as humans, as individuals, that we can't even have the conversation. It doesn't get into our, our psyches and our experiences. It sort of becomes, um, it stays here and doesn't get into, and we've got to really change our social, the way we interact with each other uh, so that we are socially sustainable, which means that as Black people, we don't need to go through the world on defense. And that is the absolute truth about that space. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy, very much. Next question. And this is for Claire as a follow up. Um, in addition to the historical factors, why is anti Blackness carried on at an individual and a systemic level? Who benefits? Right. So I think going back to something that Gloria brought up about immigrants coming to the U.S., and this is true of Asian immigrants as well and, and other immigrants, um, you know, Toni Morrison, I think, um, had a really powerful comment about this, that when immigrants come to the U.S., they sort of learn that to become American and to get ahead in America means yeah. learning anti-Blackness, right? Once you've learned that, you kind of can have figured out the game and how to strategize for your own advancement within that game. I mean, the answer to that is who benefits? I think everybody who's not black, but in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think white people have benefited in the most clear, forceful way from the institution of slavery and from um, all of the wealth that was generated through slavery that has been passed down through generations and contributes to the kind of inequality, the kind of grotesque economic inequality we have today in the US and the world. But I think, you know, it's important to point out as we've all been doing that um, not white groups benefit as well from anti-blackness, right? That this is a structure of power. It is part of the way that our societies organize and other groups quickly realize their advantage in going along with that game, right? So they will distance from blackness, try to approach whiteness. Um, and this happens in a variety of different ways, but if we think only in terms of white over black, then we're missing an important part of the picture. But also when you, you ask the question individual versus systemic level, when we're seeing like in the LA City Council scandal, individual people making these kinds of anti-black and also anti-indigenous comments, then um, yes, there's on one level, the question is how do we respond to those individuals as elected officials, et cetera. But 
we also can't just be satisfied with talking about them as individuals. We have to ask what is the larger cultural, social um, world that they are drawing upon, right? How are they in fact not exceptional for um, thinking these things and saying these things? Thank you. Gloria, please talk about the differing ways uh, anti-Blackness is currently exhibited, currently exhibited in Latino and AAPI communities. So um, just I think drawing from my experience uh, doing the organizing in South LA and having these types of conversations with Black and Brown community members, you know, we do the multiracial organizing and that requires having some difficult conversations. I would say that um, the first thing that comes to mind with this question is this issue of denial. And I think the first thing is that as, as, as a group of people, we need to first acknowledge the impact of white, the white supremacy has had in the Latino uh, community, right? Uh, the whitewashing that we have done to our history, our culture, even our people. Um, having conversations about um, uh, Black Latinos, right? With Latinos uh, from other that, that are brown or white. And the reaction that folks get with that in terms of who they identify as, who, who's Latino and who's not Latino. And so I think that denial is key in perpetuating and maintaining uh, the um, the threat. And so we need to have those, those conversations. We need to be courageous. Uh, we need to confront the ugliness of antagonism in our community. And we need to push back, right? I think to these ideas that um, I think a lot of ideas that I hear from uh, my counterparts or other Latinos is that we're not racist, right? How can I be racist if I am brown, um, if I'm not white? Uh, but dig deeper um, and really um, you know, be able to see the, uh, the subtleness sometimes. And I would like re re-elevate like the scandal. This is why we're having this conversation, right? Because we have had this recent scan scandal in the city of L.A., um, but we need to acknowledge that anti-Blackness is larger than that scandal. It's larger than those people. Um, those four elected officials don't necessarily represent all Latinos, but we also must hold ourselves accountable that honest and that reality, those comments, whether they were subtle or they were just, you know, very violent, um, those are the same things that we hear in our communities and those same things that we hear in our family gatherings, Right. Um, and we've heard a lot of defense uh, within the Latino community of, you know, well, we've heard other people say worse things. Um, it, you know, it, it, those are things that we hear every day. It really didn't mean, they really didn't harm. And um, I think that is a way that it, that it still shows itself present on a daily basis as an individual uh, community member or as a, uh, as a community as a whole. Um, and the one thing that I would do want to elevate in terms of how it shows up, um, not only individually, but I think in our community. And I think for me, it, it really worries me is that policy and systems are created through worldview analysis. So individual people that we elect are the ones who lead the developed policies and systems. And our communities, particularly low income communities, depend on these policies and these systems. And so when these systems are created through this worldview analysis, which include anti-blackness and who has more value and commodifying people based on the color of their skin, this is when we end up with policies and systems that are actually um, violent, that actually put the lives of our, of our community members on the front lines, whether it's because of environmental issues, climate, whether it's criminal justice issues, education, um, economic um mobility, all of those things are the things that shape our lives and also shape our life expectancy. Um, and so to me, uh, the reason why this is really important to have this conversation and it is important to hold our elected officials at a higher standard is because these are the folks who are leading uh, the development of these policies and the structures uh, that are important and key for our community members. Thank you very much. Tracy, let's talk about U.S. political structure. Uh, so how does anti-Blackness interplay with the pursuit and maintenance of power in the U.S.? And I'm talking about, you know, things like supporting it, justifying it, fueling it. Uh, and can you talk about what you've seen in California poli uh, party politics? Sure. Well, actually, uh, Gloria uh, sort of alluded to 
uh, the importance, you know, of the lenses of the, of the people that we elect. And if you're not at the table, um, most likely your point of view is not going to be taken into consideration. And that trickles down, you know, to the the, the folks that are, um, you know, generally people of color, especially uh, Black people being at the, pot, the bottom of the caste system. So um, having said that, it's it's challenging when we talk about politics because we're talking about a system that was created at a time when um, Black people were not considered human. And that continues. So it's it's very difficult to hear when folks say, it's the Constitution, why wasn't it considered human then? So how are, how are you applying that to me? So there's such a level of, the level of distrust is, is um, I, need, I need to say no more about that. Um, it's clear that uh, systems that were created were not created for specifically Black people who were not considered human. Now, having said that, when you have folks that have been elected to office um, all the way up and down from school board, all the way up to the presidency, um, generally, why would you want to change a system that you have been successful in infiltrating? You are now in this system. Once you've been elected, it is very difficult to be unseated. Um, you are now a part of this sort of family, and um, and you have your colleagues, and and you have bills and legislation that you're working on. Sometimes for decades, you know, until the timing is right for it to go through. So there are long relationships in politics. So when we're dealing with this anti-blackness that is the foundation of our system as a whole, our political system especially, then you move into that, the relationships that have been built. Um, the majority of folks that are in office at this time are actually um, baby boomers. So that is um, a different generation as well that has experienced, you know, Jim Crow and, and many were aligned, in alignment with it. I mean, I believe it's only been, um, what is it, 40, 47 years since uh, Jim Crow ended and we're still feeling the ramifications not only of slavery, but also Jim Crow. There are uh, folks that in within their cultures um, continue to perpetuate the, um, the challenges that we're talking about, anti-Blackness. And that is very much a part of the system. It's very much just a part of the system. Now, are we saying that it is something that is strategic, that no, we're going to keep you know, uh, black people out. I don't believe usually is that it is that um, pointed. Um, it is just the way it is. It's just the system that's been built. And in order to interrupt that system, we we must be make conscious decisions that this group is being left out. And these are the reasons. And then figure out how do we effectively bring these folks into the fold. Now, anybody arriving late to anything is going to have, it's going to be challenging. And like we're talking about, I'm the first um, African-American woman to be elected to chair the Democratic Party of Sacramento County. We're seeing our first black mayors, we're our first black female mayors, our first black governors. We're seeing all these firsts. But anybody who has been the first of anything will tell you that it is extremely challenging. So not only are now we're having these opportunities and folks are actually making conscious decisions to bring it, to you know fight this anti-blackness and bring in um, black people, the, the systems, the environment, the culture is not one where that is easy to thrive in as the only one and being the bottom of the caste system. So it's more than just getting them in. It's, it's, it's also um, creating an environment, um, listening to them at the table. You know, when they have something to say, supporting their legislation, it's just such a um, it's very challenging. And we see it across the board um, in California. I know the Democratic Party. I actually sit on the Jedi Committee as well, which is the Justice, Equity, um, uh, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. So the Democratic Party of California is focusing specifically on making this this change, making it a part of everyday conversation, um, anti-racism, anti-black, um, anti-blackness. Um, just everything across the board, LGBTQ. Um, but again, we are at this place as a culture, as a society, where we are just at the beginning of truly understanding uh, the impact of anti-Blackness and that it is worldwide, just different aspects of it. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, before I move on to the next question, just because it's been um, noted, uh, I think a few times already today, um, our first webinar, so the series really, uh, you know, came out of our uh, recognition and our reaction to uh, what happened last October, which was the release of the recording of the racist, horrific racist comments of the LA City Council. 
So I do want to acknowledge that our first webinar, if you didn't know, uh, was examining that topic. But um, rather than making the webinar uh, completely about uh, the recording, we said we the webinar was really positioning that event, if you will, as a case study in the ongoing right reality of racism in politics. Um, so I want to invite anyone who's interested in that conversation again to to see the the recording and the link is in is in the chat. Um, all right. So next question. This is for Tracy and Claire. So I'll ask this time Tracy for you to go first and then Claire. Um, how much recognition of anti-blackness occurs within communities of color and overall US society? And I know Gloria, you've touched on some of this, so go where you want to go. Um, but Tracy, please take that first. Uh, that's a difficult question to answer, um, just because recognition means different things to different folks. Um, and again, I, I travel the country um, working with uh, organizations, nonprofit, um, government, uh, just uh, political organizations, uh, facilitating what we call social sustainability work, but it's it's uh, culture change, organizational culture and system change. And um, I will tell you that the pain is there where um where you know folks will say this is happening or this has happened but as Gloria alluded to um earlier there's a denial um there is um just complete rejection of it and when we talk about uh within the communities themselves uh it, it it's basically as Gloria said earlier it just depends on the community um with the African American community we cannot help but see it. And when I say African American, again, I'm, I'm referring to the descendants of the American enslaved, um, because we have been raised in this country to survive. Um, you know, when when I have four children, um, two boys, two girls, and when I sent my my first son off to college, you know, I wasn't, um, you know, and, and I'm the first earning college degree, so you know, we're breaking the cycle. And he went off to college. And I was so proud. But most parents, you know, train their children to, you know, be independent and, and you know, whereas we're also training them to survive the world that is out there. So um, anti-Blackness within the Black community is, is very clear, um, very per pervasive, and is a part of the infrastructure of growing up. You know, when you're called the inward for the first time, you know, you're prepared for those things. Um, how do you react um, if uh, you cannot allow them to see you sweat? You must stay in control and power, you know, that whole nine yards because if something goes down, you're the one that will go to jail or, you know, be accused of it. So having said that, um, I believe in other communities, it, it is considered something of the past often or not impactful um, or, or they didn't mean it, as was mentioned earlier. It's just words. Words, what, how many times have we heard that? You know, sticks and stones. Um, words can break your psyche, break your spirit. Um, it especially, um, it creates an identity that many people of color, especially black people, um, will actually align with, not realizing it, have their own biases that have been created by what has been seen in the media, um, hearing those words at school and no one saying anything about it because they didn't mean it. So it's it's a complex question. We're at different levels of understanding and awareness and what I have seen on the road actually dealing with individuals of all ethnicities is that um, the discomfort around the subject throws their bodies into fight or flight and nothing gets in nothing gets out. It stays at a very high level. And that's why the discussion has changed or that's not true. It's not happening here or I've never seen it. And it's it's extremely challenging to think about changing this in a organization, which we have the ability to blow up everything and start over. Imagine trying to do this in the U.S. Thank you. I'll turn to Claire. And again, the question was how much recognition of anti-Blackness occurs within communities of color and overall U.S. society? Say not very much. And I think with, as a democracy, I mean, going back to what Tracy was saying about the Constitution, we present ourselves and especially elected officials and the media, we present ourselves as a democracy. And the story that we are telling about anti-Blackness goes against that fundamental self-perception. So it is a contradiction that most people don't want to deal with. So in, when January 6th happens, you know, white Americans say, oh no, there's there may be a strain of fascism 
um, in American political culture, whereas black communities are saying, well, we've been talking about the fascism in American political culture. You know, Langston Hughes in the 40s, the Black Panthers in the 60s. We've been talking about that for a long time. Um, Secondly, I would say, you know, because um, the state is an important actor here in advancing and reproducing anti-blackness, but the state is also working in service of capitalism and capitalism and anti-blackness, I think, according to scholars in black studies, again, whose work I'm following, are very much intertwined. And Gloria's nodding because she knows from her frontline work how true this is. So um, there's also an aspect of capitalism What we know as soon as capitalism is in the picture, and it is in every picture, that we're talking about ideology. We're talking about um, deliberately brainwashing and indoctrinating people so that they don't see certain realities. And one of the realities is anti-Blackness. And I think this is why we have arguments around the 1619 Project, about trying to educate Americans on slavery and the impact on everything in American life. We have arguments about critical race theory, whether it should be banned you know, at the state level, which many states have already done. All of this is about an ideological and political struggle to tell the truth about anti-blackness and other forms of racial oppression or not to tell the truth or to continue hiding it. And then the last point I'd make is just that the term racism, I hope, is a term that we can start to really critically rethink, because as important as it has been and sometimes continues to be in certain contexts, It's also a term that obfuscates, right? It's a term that conceals and misleads because if we say racism, we're really saying anybody can be racist against anybody else. And that kind of, um, you know, sort of dilutes or erases the fact that what we're talking about with anti-blackness is a specific structural foundational feature of U.S. society. Then the question becomes, how do we relate anti-Latinx or anti-Asian violence and hatred to that. And that's an ongoing political intellectual question. But to see that overall architecture of anti-blackness, just to understand it as a structural feature of society, that's something that gets hidden when we use the word racism. So just to, uh, you know, a note to encourage people to think about that. Thank you very much for those points. Um, Gloria, so how has the LA City Council recording impacted the discourse and level of recognition on this topic? So media coverage, advocacy, discussion of families, communities, take it where you like. Yeah, so yeah, so thank you for what was said before. I, I just want to quickly say related to this, the, the, the piece about recognition, I think um, the way that it has, been, it has impacted us is that we've had to have these hard conversations. And in fact, we've had to pause some of our policy, critical policy work to really dig deep, right? We do put ongoing political consciousness, leadership development, having these racial justice conversations, but we've had to stop and really um, ask ourselves, where are we in in, in this conversation? And I would say this term of recognition, I think, you know, we we have seen some improvement, particularly with grassroots leadership um, at at the grassroots level in South LA, where folks are having this conversation, some folks acknowledging, right, uh, the harm uh, um, and the violence against Black people in South LA. Um, so there has been movement, but I think for me, the question is, how to, has there been movement between recognition and action? And I think um, someone mentioned, maybe it was Claire, that they mentioned that um, there are folks, right, uh, in the Latino community in particular, who do benefit from anti-Blackness and the perpetuation of anti-Blackness. And so I think that's the question for me. How do we go from recognition and having this conversation of recognition of being willing? How willing are we then to give up our own benefit um, and to change the system that has been benefiting, uh, we've been benefiting from? I would say that um, in order to dismantle anti-Blackness, we must dismantle the system to perpetuate and sustain inequity and systemic oppression. Um, basically, we're talking about the, the casta, the caste system, right? Um, I think for us um, is that we're doing this work on the ground is analyzing with our community members the existing systems and thinking about how we reconstruct them. This is hard and this is not immediate. But how do we ensure that we are creating systems that serve everyone regardless of color of skin? Um, This means our education system, our health system, our criminal justice system, our housing system. 
but most importantly, our economic, our beloved economic system here in this country, right, that we protect so deeply. Um, and so how do we dig deep and elevate that critical analysis about the role that capitalism, which has already been mentioned, what is the role that capitalism has played in oppressing Black community members and maintaining anti-Blackness, not only here in the United States, but in our countries of origins and what we have brought into our own communities? And so I would say that it has impact, it, it has had an impact, right? Um, organizing black around, among Black and brown multiracial organizing is not easy because we're not doing the organizing in a vacuum, right? We are having these conversations. We are making progress. But when we hear the media, when we hear the framing uh, uh, that throws a Black community under the bus and always... Um, and and that always um, makes black community the culprit of the of the societal uh, problems that we have or our community problems that sneaks into our our efforts and and so um, you know we've had to have hard conversation as I said um, scope and some of our allies we've had to pause some of our work critical work work that really has an impact on the lives and the well being of community members. Because we're dealing, we're grappling with this problem, not only because it's a, a, a problem, a, a conversation that we need to have, but we really need to make sure we're really making sure that we are placing ourselves in action to hold our, our elected officials accountable. Not only the four elected officials who were cut in the reporting, but all of our elected officials, and that we can continue as business as usual in this city if we really haven't been able to have deep conversations about what is going on and how, again, policies and systems are created. And so it has had an impact. One last thing that I do want to mention is that it has required for us um, and, and, and staff um, at SCOPE and also members in South LA to put their lives on the line to really step up in action. Um, that has meant that we have had to go to other uh, communities outside of South LA to, to really activate our voice and say this is wrong and we need to do something about it. We can't ignore what just has happened in the city of LA. And that means that sometimes we are welcome with open arms in other communities. And it means that sometimes we're not welcome with open arms in other communities. And we have been told, go back to South LA. What are you doing here in East LA or Boyle Heights or um, West Lake Village? What are you doing here? Um, pushing back on our own elected officials, right? Um, and it has meant that we have had to make decisions about the fact that this is important for us and we will continue to elevate our voice. So it has been difficult. Um, it has um, uh, paused some of our work, but we think that this is extremely important. At the end of the day, this is what matters. Racial equity is what matters. And we can pass policies, um, but if racial equity is not at the center of the work that we're doing, then really we're not making the the, the groundwork um, movement that we need to be making. Thank you very much, Gloria. So our last question, this is for Claire and Glor uh, Gloria. I'll ask Claire to go first this time. What do you think should be, can be done to counter anti-Blackness and racism in our society and reduce intergroup bias? Just a small question. Um, what are the short-term levers and what needs to be done over the long-term? And I'll ask you maybe as you go through your answer to indicate your level of optimism in all of this. The first thing I would do is say, I don't see it as a matter of bias, um, but the term bias suggests this is something that's like a prejudiced attitude that we hold and that if we go through a particular educational process, we can let go of that biased attitude. I think this is about material interest and about our psychic investments, so psychic and material investments um, in, a, in a structure of power that has shaped the U.S. from the beginning. Um, and so in terms of change, I think it has to be profound, structural, fundamental change and um, how to bring that about and um, how to think about that is, is a very challenging question. Um, just to mention one thing, in addition to the kind of work I think that um, Gloria and Tracy are doing, um, I think that Black studies should be a requirement for all college students, not just ethnic studies, but Black studies in particular. I think students need to learn the truth about slavery. That's just a first step to understanding, for example, why California 
among all states is having a reparations commission where they're talking seriously. Why California and not Alabama? Because there was slavery in California and there was the aftermath of slavery in California. So I'm glad that the state is doing um, a reparations committee and we might see something coming out of that. But, you know, for those of people who think when you talk about radical, fundamental, structural change, that sounds impossible. Um, you know, given the ecological crisis we're in, given the the role that capitalism and anti-blackness have, have played in creating that ecological crisis, we are going to need some kind of radical structural change. We're not going to be able to keep on doing what we're doing without going off of the cliff, the edge of the cliff in, in ecological terms. So big change is coming. And the question is, how are we going to recognize the um, importance of um, dismantling anti-blackness and um, moving toward something that um, some kind of racial justice at the same time that we try to save uh, life on the planet. Thanks, Claire. And I'll move on to Gloria for the same question, but also note that um, that's that's the last question for Gloria and um, Claire. And then we have one more question, our last question for Tracy in a moment. I just wanted to say in terms of long term, I'll just reiterate what I said previously and then what Claire also alluded to in terms of a restructuring of our systems. We need to do some, I mean, it's it's really reconstructing the system that is not it's not only not working for a group of people, but it has been created to oppress a group of people. And so we need to reconstruct our systems and relook at our policy. I think for immediate, um, definitely in terms of the work that we do is continue to hold ourselves accountable, continue to hold our family members, our community members, have these difficult conversations. But I also want to remind us that this conversation or the crisis of the tapes that we've heard from elected officials was about power and was about redistricting. And we can't forget about that. And so I think immediately we also need to have conversations about the fact that we need to continue fighting for equitable democratic representation, particularly for those communities who are at the front line, um, but also have not have a place at the table. And so that's the work that we're committed to do to continue pushing back at the fact that, um, you know, we, we cannot permit um, elected officials to water down the power of uh, black community members, of black communities, of voters. Um, and so I think that's an important piece and that's work that can be done immediately. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Tracy, your last question. Drawing on your experience, what do you think is needed to build pl uh, black political power? Well, to answer that question, you know, we must first can sort of address what is political power, you know, sort of how, how do we, gain political power. And it's, from my experience, it's it's wealth and it's social status and gender, um, ethnic and gender status, um, which is sort of the top. Um, if you don't have the wealth or the opportunities of the, let's just say white male, um, then it, it's going to be a little bit more challenging. And I know this is controversial to say out loud, um, but this is the work that we do, the conversations that we have, you know, 24 seven. So we're already at a disadvantage in addition to the systems that are in place, uh, the anti-blackness um, that permeates everything that we touch, um, every political policy that is created is embedded somehow within. Um, you know, right now, legisl legislation is, de um, decency is legislated. So if we want to be able to wear our hair, for example, you know, the, the Crown Act, we had to pass a piece of legislation to be able to wear natural hair. Um, natural, And when we talk about natural hair, of course, um, we could not say specifically, often you couldn't use uh, the term black hair because then um, it would be challenging to get that through. But we know what that's about. And so we've had to pass that law just to be, just to be able to wear our natural hair. So from there, people say, oh, you can't wear your natural hair? Holy cow. And then the awareness happens and you start to understand some of the challenges. And for us to make transformational change um, it is challenging. We, we make incremental changes um, throughout time. And it's usually at, as the result of a George, I mean, um, um, some a George Floyd or one of those something happens that's dramatic. And then we have a window of opportunity to go in and do what we can really quickly before it goes back to the norm. So when we talk about building political power and specifically building black political power, um, one of the one of the major 
areas of focus. Of course, systemically, we're already working on, you know, voter engagement and training, the work that Gloria is doing, uh, the work that uh, Claire is doing with her book and spreading the education, um, recruiting and training and electing um, Black officials. And then, but most importantly, where we're missing out there is actually supporting them once they're elected, you know, because they're often, it's it's a one-time, it's a one-term position because there is an, a movement to sort of move out this lens that is making trouble or saying things that uh, folks are not comfortable in saying, not supporting their legislation. I mean, it's it's really challenging when you get in. So, of course, those are areas that we need to focus on. But I also believe another area of focus is going back to the culture that's been created from the anti-Blackness within the Black community. That is a challenge. We, we, we talk about, we're talking tonight or today about um, you know, anti-Blackness in the Asian and um, and the uh, Latinx communities. But any oppressed people um, tend to oppress others. You are div divided and conquered. It is historic throughout time, no matter the um, what we're talking about. We could even talk about women pitted against each other because there could only be one. So when we talk about the culture that's been created from this anti-Blackness, that it permeates the black community, the division there, the um, there can only be one often, um, this fighting pitting against each other, which has been, again, a system that has been used to pull out a black person that might be considered a leader, um, elevate them in some way so that they turn away from their communities. Um, when you see a person of color, a black person specifically, that needs that uh, folks want to remove, like uh, the, the mayor of um, Stockton, I've forgotten his name, but he is phenomenal change maker, um, breaking systems, turning things around. They recruited a black man to run against him and unseated him. That is consistently what happens. And we participate in that. There are some communities that would say, no, absolutely not. I'm not going to go against another woman or another um, person who's Latinx or whatever it might be. So in addition to what we've talked about before, what we've been talking about really, you know, my full existence, um, we also need to um, focus on the rebuilding and, and often cases building the Black community from a place of power and um, cohesiveness and uh, helping us to learn to work together and that we no longer are in this place, um, at least the way it was where we have to be pitted against each other, where there can only be one, where, where you know, you get food, but you do not, that we're not at that place, but we are still most definitely in a place of struggle and in a place of survival. So this is also a cultural issue, and it's going to take all of it um, in order for us to see true change and healing in this nation. Thank you, Tracy. So we have just a few minutes left here uh, for uh, questions from our audience. And I see here we've got a few questions. I think a, a couple of them already have been answered. Um, so what I think I'll do is I'm going to present one question uh, and ask who would like to jump in on it and, and take, take, a, take a tackle. So um, the question is, are you able to speak to a possible difference between racism and economic classism that may be present? Clearly, so uh, clearly, the words of so many of the city council members also speak to the sense of social elitism and classism. Panelists, would any of you like to jump in on that one and give a, a brief um, answer? I would just jump in real quick and say they're not mutually exclusive. These Thank you. We choose between, right? Because that's what I meant when uh, I say that um, scholars in Black studies and scholars in ethnic studies are talking about how anti-blackness and capitalism go together, right? Cedric Robinson's famous work on racial capitalism, that term suggesting race and, you know, um, economic domination, economic inequality go together. So um, it's often not a, choi a choice between one or the other. It's the, the things going on together and articulating with one another. And if I can and add to that, you know, we uh, view this in the field as a symptom of the bigger issue. Um, and so when we talk again, they're not mutually exclusive. However, it is a fallout from the anti-blackness that that is the result. When we talk about education, um, you know, not being uh, basically allowed to 
um, the educated in white schools or mainstream schools. There's challenges with the African-American students being the, the um, lowest performing students, you know, in the California school system. We tried legislation to move that forward because of affirmative action and other things. We can't say black students. So we've said the lowest performing students and what we put money there. And then whomever is lowest performing after that, it's that, that funding. Um, however, it's, it's, it's all tied together. And what we need to realize is that, you know, one of the lovely saying that when the flower doesn't bloom, you know, you don't blame the flower. You look at the soil, you look at the sun, you look at the nutrients that it's receiving. And because of this culture of anti-Blackness, it is affected every possible area of a Black, um, the Black community's uh, existence. Thank you, Tracy. And then Gloria, I'll um, I'll read this question to you because it stressed you directly. You know, in in about a minute, if you wouldn't mind seeing what you can, how you want to uh, take it on. Um, so in Los Angeles, uh, the Latinx community has been heavily recruited into the police force, and this career is seen as an honorable path within the community. Seeing as, and this is again part of the question, seeing as policing, fascism, and anti-blackism, blackness, excuse me, are all intertwined. How can we begin to interrupt the Latinx participation in sustaining white supremacy through policing? Thank you for that question. Um, that's a complex question, but I would. It, what it makes me think of this, it also makes me think of this term Latinada, which I we, we haven't uh, brought up. But the term Latinada is a term that acknowledges and links a collective experience of, of Latino, of, the, of Latino culture, uh, of, of Latin America. But a lot of times it's also connected or implies Latin, Latino pride, uh, the can-do spirit, uh, the American, the, uh, the pursuit of the American dream, um, the ability to pull yourself from the bootstraps, and, and that to me is connected to a conversation that sometimes we land up having in community, which we uh, one of my colleagues has coined as the um, oppression Olympics. Who has it worse, right? And I, I think this is connected to that, that we have as, as a Latino community in this term of Latinada, where we've excluded Black Latinos from, where we've excluded Indigenous people from. But Latinada is really those folks who can do, who have the success spirit, the can-do spirit, can pull themselves from the bootstraps, can come to this country as an immigrant or a second generation child and be able to find themselves in a career, in a pathway that gives them authority and where they're doing the right thing, where they're contributing to this um, to this society. And I would say that part of it is pushing back on those things that seem good, right? There's nothing wrong with being to have pride in being Latino. There's nothing, I mean, there's nothing bad in being prideful of being Latino, but I think at the expense of what? That's the conversations that we need to have. What does it mean for me to be successful? What does it mean for my children to be successful in this country, in my community, at the expense of who? And so I think that it's part of those conversations we need to have with parents, with young people, about what does it mean to contribute and what does it mean to help your community, right? Um, the good, again, it's this whole thing around the good versus the bad, the evil versus the good. Uh, what we see as um, things that are honorable as opposed to things that are dishonorable, um, that are deeply connected with our views of, of Black culture and Black people. And so we need to continue having those conversations and really check ourselves sometimes on the things that seem good for our community, but definitely are harmful uh, for the, the folks um, around us. Thank you very much. So that concludes our webinar today. I wanna to thank our esteemed panelists again very much for joining us and for all of your thoughts and insights uh, and your honesty in the conversation. Uh, I also wanna thank um, our partners in this webinar series again. So the California Black Freedom Fund, the Latino Community Foundation and the AAPI Civic Engagement Fund. And of course, again, our home partners uh, our home partner at uh, the USC Price School of Public Policy and everyone uh, associated with making this happen. Um, for those of you uh, that may be interested in seeing this again or sharing this webinar, um, in about a week or so, we will have the, the links to the recording or recordings. There'll be highlight reel as well. And we'll make sure that gets out through the networks. And again, we have two more webinars in this series. The next one is on redistricting. Um, and we'll be announcing more details about that very shortly. So thank you again very, very much. Have a good rest of the day and please continue the conversation.